Welcome to the Cherry Becker Tax Beat, a conversation about tax that matters. Welcome to this edition of the Cherry Becker Tax Beat Podcast. Today we are talking about tax deductions, that's plural, deductions, for creating energy efficient commercial buildings and accelerated depreciation deductions for short-lived assets. That's a mouthful, and we'll get into more of the details as we go. Um, We're specifically talking about IRC Section 179D and the related cost segregation studies for commercial buildings. Uh, Joining in the conversation today are two colleagues from our Tax Credits and Incentives Advisory Team, Glenn Lemieux and Andre Kong, specializing in these areas of credits. And let's see, uh, Glenn, Glenn's the director. You're sitting in Grand Rapids, Michigan today. How's the weather out in your neck of the woods? The weather is warm, but a little uh, muggy. Uh, thunderstorms today, but I, I enjoy the weather. How hot has it been getting? It's been up to the 90s, but it's, the last what? month has been low 80s. It's been very enjoyable. It's not snowing, Brooks. That's all that matters. All right. Andre, from the burbs of Houston, Texas, how's the weather <laughs> down in your neck of the woods? Well, that must be nice. Uh, it was probably close to 200 degrees yesterday here in Houston. Uh, the weather says that it's 86 right now, but I don't know about that. It doesn't feel like 86. Is it dry or humid? Very humid. Wow. Very humid. It's like taking a shower when you walk outside. All right. Doesn't sound fun. But anyway, what can you say? You live in Texas in the summer. That's what you're going to get. And all right. And as always, my partner in crime, Sarah McGregor from Greenville, South Carolina. Um, Ms. McGregor, how's life treating you? Life is good. There's no snow here and uh, the humidity (laughs) is down. So this is the place everyone wants to be today. Is it good bike riding weather? In it is. Colorado? It's very good bike biking weather right now. All right. Well, that's good enough. Good enough. All right. I'm sitting here in Richmond. We've been in a string of pretty uh, nice, nice days. You know, not hot and sunny, but not grossly hot and sunny. All righty. So let's move on to today's topic of conversation. The IRA, otherwise known as Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, enhanced and expanded the Section 179D Energy Efficient Building Deduction. Uh, This incentive rewards building owners, architects, engineers, system designers, possibly other assorted players for engaging in energy efficient construction of commercial buildings. Um, A cost segregation study is an analysis of the component parts of said commercial building to identify the cost of assets they may have a shorter depreciable life. All righty, so uh, let's let the experts get in on this and let me stop mucking it up. So Glenn, why don't you talk to us a little bit about cost segregation studies? What are they? Why would a building owner be interested in it? Absolutely, and sadly, as an engineer, I find this exciting. So if if anybody listening is falling asleep, I apologize, but um, (laughs) You know, cost segregation studies are uh, an important part of an overall tax strategy that uses accelerated depreciation to defer a building owner's tax liability. A lot of mouthful, but essentially what we're doing is during a study, we're breaking out certain building components into asset classes that the IRS allows us to depreciate faster. So an example would be on a commercial building, we're breaking out, say, the cost for carpet would be a five-year asset. Um, the decorative lighting five-year asset, or a 15-year asset would be land improvements, where, which are anything exterior to the building, like parking lots is a main one. So um, another great benefit that is in play here, aside from the accelerated depreciation, is bonus depreciation. So bonus has been around since around 2001. It's created really to encourage you know, commercial development. And it's one big change in the IRA, really the only change affecting cost segregation was we went from 100% bonus for about four years, and now we're on a declining bonus scale. It started uh, 80% in 23, uh, 60 in 24, and it goes out in 27. So what that means is that in addition to the accelerated depreciation in the buckets of five and 15-year properties, 
for like 2024, 60% bonus means I take that five-year bucket and I write off 60% off the top. Same with 15 years. So anything under 20 year that we break out is bonus eligible. So, uh, you know, a great example would be like a manufacturer. Say in 24, they opened a $10 million facility. Um, say we pulled out 20% personal property and maybe 10% land improvement. So that's the five year and the 15 year. This would mean out of the 10 million, we pulled out about $3 million in accelerated depreciable assets. Bonus on that is about 1.8 million. So you can see how substantial this accelerated depreciation combined with bonus can really be for a taxpayer. So Glenn, is this only applicable for uh, new construction, first time placed in service, or can you use this for buildings that have been around for a bit? Yeah, good question. Uh, before the Tax Cut and Job Act of 2017, you could only take bonus on new construction. So it had to be ground up new construction. One big change back in 17 going to 18 was that acquired properties can also be bonus eligible. So, um, you know, we can do studies on new construction. We can do studies on significant renovations and we can do studies on acquisitions. Uh, so you bought an office building or hotel or apartment facility and all of those are bonus eligible. Well, and again, I you know, getting back to your numerical example, I mean, it's not unusual to get a 20% first year write off um, when you do a cost segregation. So if you have, if it's the right building, sometimes a little less, sometimes you get lucky, it's a little more, but. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, yep. And, great, um, you know, the example, this is a good manufacturers, things like that have a lot of dedicated equipment, dedicated plumbing are great that have very high, uh, high end um, uh, five and 15 year buckets. So, Glenn, I like to think about cost segregation studies as taking out all the things that in the building that are there for the business that's operating in the building and leaving the building shell itself as the long lived asset. So if you have a medical practice, you've got lots of extra plumbing and uh, things of that sort going in. If you're a, a high tech, you've got lots of extra computer wiring and networks and uh, uh, network rooms that need to be cooled and cooling systems and same thing for, you know, a restaurant in a building, something like that. Is that, is my idea and the way I think about this, a, a, a reasonable way to think about a cost seg study? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you, you, do you need a spot on my team? Because that was perfect. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So it's really, you know, what we don't, it's all building component related. What we, yep, the good example is if I took this factory I just mentioned, I picked it up and shook it, everything that falls out, generally the owner knows how to handle that. That's the equipment. They know that's five or seven years. They know things. What I'm looking at is breaking out the building components that, like you said, the dedicated plumbing, the, um, the cabinetry in most instances, uh, carpet or vinyl flooring, those things are building components that we break out of that long life property, which for a factory is 39 years. And for an apartment facility, we'd be 27 and a half years. So a great way to, to help finance through the tax, accelerated tax savings, uh, the, the early costs of these uh, acquisitions or construction. Yes, yeah, specifically to bonus, that's a, that's a benefit in the first year the building is placed in service. So you get that all that depreciation up front in that first year. You know, and typically people want their money ahead of time. So if you have a big write-off that goes against your income, you're paying less taxes, and you can use that money you're paying your taxes with to invest in other things. So, Glenn, how do you guys go about doing this? Uh, do you have to uh, go on site? You're an engineer. What do you? What does your team bring to the table here? Yeah, it really depends. Most most uh, studies require site visits. So if you look at, if we just take the factory example, um, either this would come through us through the website, or you know we have a great group of partners at our firm that uh, really have relationships with their clients. So something like this would probably come through a partner or a director, senior manager, manager, um, and they would say, hey, look, I have a client that built a building. We would get on a call with the client, kind of talk through the facts and circumstances. Um, you know. For new construction right away, I'd say, do you have any construction costs? Let's just start there because that gives me a good idea of the real building components. Um, from that, I can propose, I can put together a, a totally free proposal. Um, the proposal will tell you what the estimated benefit is. It's estimated because we don't know until we do the study, but we'll give a range on that and then our fee. Uh, if the client uh, likes what they see, uh, like what they see, we have a call. Um, we sign an engagement and then it's really collecting the data. Well, you know, for this example, building drawings are very important. Um, 
the costs outside the pay application or, or, gen, or the general contractor costs because there's other things like architectural fees and permits and things like that that the IRS really requires you to capitalize as part of the project. So it's, it's a big data collection and then the team gets to work. Um, and so uh, at the end, we'll, we'll come up with a, a final study and uh, we go over it with the client and when everybody's happy, we finalize and they, they take their, their deductions to the bank. Great. All right, all right. Let's shift gears just a little bit and head to 179D down the highway, the section 179D. Uh, Andre, it's not a new Senate, it's been around a while, but give us a little background on this very important code section. Sure, so uh, section 179D was introduced by the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Uh, so the first time we would start seeing some of those deductions uh, taken advantage of would have been 2006, right? So worth up to $1.80 per square foot in tax deductions of the building, uh, as long as that building beat a fifth, beat the ASHRAE standard from 90.1-2007 that's by 50% or more. So an example of that would be, let's say you had a 100,000 square foot hospital, uh, it would be a maximum of 180,000 in tax deductions. Now in 2008, uh, this was expanded to uh, government entities to allocate the deduction to qualified designers. Uh, so that would look like an architect, an engineer, a design build contractor. Um, Notice 2008-40 also specifically states that you have to create technical specifications uh, for the installation of energy efficient commercial building. And uh, because government entities have very large and very sometimes energy efficient buildings, uh, that was a major role in getting more folks involved uh, in this provision. So in 2020, uh, Section 170D was made permanent uh, via the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And also, uh, they went ahead and adjusted uh, the deduction up from $1.80 to $1.82 for inflation. And then in 2022, that's when we started seeing a lot of the really good changes, right? So there's an increase in deductions based on uh, those annual energy savings up from $1.88 when adjusted for inflation up to $5.36 per square foot max. So you take a look at that same hospital that was 100,000 square feet. Now you're up at $536,000 in potential uh, tax savings. So uh, it also introduced a new prevailing wage and apprenticeship hour requirements, um, allowed for repeat deductions every three to four years. Uh, now uh, there's a reduced annual energy cost savings of just 25% for baseline qualifications. It also broadened the parties eligible to allocate. So not for profit organizations, churches, religious institutions, tribal lands, and other uh, tax exempt entities can now also allocate. So, so when you say allocate, yeah, sorry, Andre. When you when you say allocate, that means that uh, these organizations that don't usually pay tax and couldn't benefit from a tax deduction, they can in effect give that deduction to the architects or engineers or designers that uh, and, and and design build organizations that help to put these uh, energy efficient solutions into the building. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, so you know because these uh, tax exempt entities don't actually pay taxes, they are a they are eligible to allocate uh, those to the designers who do pay taxes. Now, some things that we are seeing um, in the not for profit space, uh, we're starting to see uh, not for profit organizations find ways to benefit for themselves, uh, which you know are are some really cool and creative incentives that they that they've come up with. Uh, now, this is a tax deduction after all, so they can't benefit from a tax deduction. But what we have seen are uh, extended warranty periods for some of their maybe mechanical or more expensive equipment. Uh, we've seen straight line donations back to some of maybe their underfunded programs and, you know, even, you know, a reduction in uh, some of their future construction costs uh, for those contractors that they work with on a repeat basis. So it's a really good win-win scenario there uh, for the designer. They're contributing to a, a, a tax exempt entity, so that's also a tax write-off uh, for them. Uh, it's a tax write-off uh, for our consulting fees. <laughs> so uh, just a lot of tax deductions and write-offs available for designers for sure. So Andre, can we 
you know, dig just a little deeper to exactly who they can allocate to, you know, uh, you know, what level of participation in designing do you need to get to to be able to get this, get an allocation? Gotcha. So uh, architects, as you know, are very heavily involved. I mean, they are the the ultimate technical specification generator, right? Um, engineers, likewise, uh, they have a hand in setting uh, uh, many of the technical specifications as well. And and then you started, you know, looking at maybe some submechanical contractors like uh, controls contractors, for example. They they set uh, a lot of the conditions for the types of material that will be selected and installed. And uh, a lot of that information is found on the as-built drawings. So those are all considered as contributions to technical specifications. But what happens, if, um, uh, does the not-for-profit governmental entity-ish uh, have discretion on, on who to allocate to? I mean, there's only so much to go around. If you got you know, multiple hands at the table, do they, do they ultimately get to decide or, or they can pick and choose? So absolutely, they are sovereign in who they choose to allocate to, if they choose to allocate at all. Uh, and, you know, that's something that we help our clients with. If, let's say, there's an opportunity for uh, a potential tax deduction, what we want to do is go ahead and engage with uh, the other designer. And by engage, I mean have a discussion with them, come up with a split. Let's say there's an allocation available at 100 percent and we have an architect client, we have an engineer who has a relationship and they want the deduction as well so we'll come up with the agreed upon split at 50 percent prepare the allocation letters and present them to the government entities so they don't have to pick and choose favorites all right so andre can we back up just a bit and talk about what are these when we talk about energy efficient improvements what kinds of things in a building are we talking about sure so uh that could be um, upgrading from hal halogen lights to LED lights. That could be a roof replacement for the building exterior. That could be new insulation materials. That could be new rooftop units, uh, HVAC controls and upgrades. It really just depends on what type of project you have. And, and I think that's one of the things that is also very cool about this incentive is that it covers both renovations and new construction projects, right? So renovations obviously are going to have their effect on improving the energy consumption of the building. Uh, and then new construction, because we're comparing your building to an ASHRAE baseline standard from 2007, there's a very, very high chance uh, that any building that is built to today's codes are going to far exceed that ASHRAE standard. Great. So I don't have to do the whole building renovation. I can do, uh, you know, half or a wing or an add-on and still have this uh, – this play in. So in, back to Glenn's example, if I've got a manufacturing facility, I'm adding another 2,000, 10,000 square feet. Um, I can I can use that, look at that for these energy efficient improvements. Correct. Uh, now, InRail does uh, have a stipulation that if there's not a firewall in between those two buildings that we could consider the deduction uh, study for the entire of the entirety of the building. And, you know, that's a that's a part of our upfront scoping uh, that we complete as well. I know Glenn kind of alluded to this, uh, but we take a look at your portfolio. We identify the, the projects that we believe will qualify, request the plans and specifications and complete a pre-energy modeling analysis. That way we know, you know, what type of deductions uh, we will be looking at before we engage. All right. There's this. Um problematic little uh, term that keeps floating around, prevailing wage and apprentice program requirements. And, and I know there have been phase-in dates and uh, the grandfather dates. Uh, what is the state of, of uh, affairs regarding this requirement? And talk a little bit about that these days. Sure. So, uh, yeah, th this has uh, been a little bittersweet <laughs> for for a lot of our clients. Uh, it, it's sweet in in that it offers you know uh, obviously competitive rates for 
for our contractors. We want them to be paid well. Uh, a few of our buddies here in our team have been part of unions before. So we want to make sure that our contractors are paid well. And then for the apprentices, we want to make sure that they have real life exposure to the business and for the continuity of construction here in America. So we want to make sure that they're getting exposure. It's just that Congress dropped this on us in November of 2022. So a very short window in order for our clients to get these things in place. And as you know, for a lot of the projects, they are designed years and years before their, the construction actually starts. So not exactly something that they planned into, uh, into the business plan. Uh, but to answer your question, Brooks, Sam.gov uh, does produce in granular detail the prevailing wage requirements that are prescribed for each state and the apprenticeship hours for projects starting after January 30th of 2023, we're 12.5% of the total man hours, and then that was increased to 15% of the total man hours of the project starting in 2024. So there's three ways to satisfy the apprenticeship requirements. So way number one would be to hire apprentices, right? Uh, way number two is to have a project that started before January 30th of 2023. So those are actually grandfathered in and won't require prevailing wages or apprenticeship hours. Um, and then way number three is to file for the good faith exemption. So this would only apply to those taxpayers who reached out diligently to job boards, uh, registered apprenticeship programs. You know, maybe you sent up some smoke signals and you weren't able to find qualified apprentices for your projects. So if these are well documented, then you should definitely uh, apply for the good faith exemption. All right, so two follow-up kind of comments or questions on this. What's at stake here for this prevailing wage and apprentice program is to get the $5 incentive. What do you, if you don't get it, what does it drop to again? Sure, so uh, in order to reach the bonus deduction uh, that, you, that you mentioned, Brooks, of $5.65 per square foot, you do have to pay a prevailing wage and have those apprentices in place. Uh, but if you don't, uh, there's still a deduction available at 50 cents or starting at 50 cents a square foot up to one dollar of the building. So, I mean, we're talking about a uh, factor of five here. In yeah, simple, essentially a factor of in five. Simple, in simple terms, as I'm counting on my fingers here. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a you know, serious, serious uh, difference in uh, benefit being able to meet that. And the second question, Andre um can you describe what we as a firm do to help clients document and prepare and plan for those requirements given what's at stake sure so uh the very first thing we do is go back and identify because you know as a as a designer you can look back three years uh to for for potential projects that will qualify for section 179d and as a building owner, if you had appreciable basis during construction, you can look back as far as 2006, right? So the first thing we do is identify your projects that wouldn't require the prevailing wages and apprenticeship hours to begin with, uh, that, that would be good for Section 179D. Secondly, uh, we want to speak with you before the project starts. So in the design phase uh, of, of your project, um, you know, uh, pre-construction phase of your project, uh, and consult you through how to best qualify for Section 179D. And then lastly, uh, there is a an intensive review uh, that we complete uh, through all of you know the provided payroll documentation um, through our, through our pay apps and any other documentation that you can provide uh, for us to identify where the prevailing wages may have been paid and how to properly uh, document that. Uh, good faith exemption if you choose to go that route. So we can we can help you with all that. So Andre, you said you can you can go back and look at buildings that were placed in service before uh, this current year or even started construction before this year to to look back on that. Who are who are the clients you see most often pursuing this? The building owners or is it architects and engineers who are working with uh, these sort of non tax paying uh, property owners? Uh, so in, in terms of a look back study or or just looking uh, back on previous projects? Either either one. Where, where, where's your hotbed for uh, for customers for for this kind of service? 
So honestly, it, it just depends on uh, who owns the building, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Commercial building owners, like I said, if they, they have a portfolio of buildings uh, that they built or renovated themselves, uh, we, we see just a, a little bit of everything. I mean, Glenn, I know you've, you've worked in the past a lot with commercial building owners. Uh, I think I have probably a little bit more uh, experience with designers itself, but uh, ha- have you seen any sort of influx uh, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, Glenn? You know what the influx is, is that little sweet spot on the IRA between when it came into play um, and and the current um, prevailing wage requirements. And what I'm referring to is um, there is a kind of a grandfather in the IRA where uh, the 179D, anything that was started before January of 23, I mean, it has to be somewhat of a significant start. You can't just say I, I wrote a utility bill, but a good start, like let's just say 22 up to uh, the January of 23, you get that full $5 deduction, but you don't have to meet the prevailing wage. So mm-hmm. it's like they understood that big projects had to start and there's no way you could start a project in, uh, you know, in January of 23 and get prevailing wage and get all those requirements. So that was a real sweet spot that we've seen a lot of where first question we ask is, oh, you're a building owner. And the second question is, when did you start the project? Because if it was before January of 23, you get the high end of the benefit and you get the uh, the, the prevailing prevailing wage requirement is waived. So that's that's where I've seen in a lot of interplay with the cost eggs. And Andre, this um, uh, opportunity for uh, doing taking 179 on multiple occasions for a building, that's that was new with the Inflation Reduction Act, correct? Correct. So that is new with the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, as so long as there has been a substantial renovation or addition to the building, every three years, a commercial building owner uh, could retake that Section 179D deduction. Every four years, a designer uh, could retake that commercial building deduction. And, and I got to say, that's a really good add-in. Uh, because, you know, one of the things that were a huge pain point for us back in the day as consultants is taking a look at a client's portfolio and, you know, seeing that, oh, OK, great. There was an addition to this building and you know, it's a hundred thousand square foot addition to an already very large building. And, you know, only to look back through even our own database and see that that deduction is already taken previously by a designer. Uh, so this actually affords uh, another opportunity for um, designers everywhere and commercial building owners uh, to really save some taxes. All right, so um, Glenn, I want to you know, kind of revisit a little bit of the topic you were just sort of bringing up and allow you opportunity for a shameless advertising. Um, <laughs> how, how does our uh, firm go about helping clients look at both call seg and 179d on a comprehensive basis well i appreciate that softball that was great um so (laughs) you know so since there you know there is some interplay between the two studies and i'm talking specifically for building owners because obviously uh not-for-profits don't pay taxes so they can't use cost segregation deductions and there's no allocations available but um you know on a new construction for a building uh owner um, because 179D is a deduction and cost segregation is a deduction, they both require a reduction in basis. So for cost segregation, the, rec- the reduction in basis is we're taking a 39-year property and breaking it into 5 and 7 and 15. Um, for the 179D, whatever that deduction is, you have to reduce the basis in the 39-year, and it's all those components that would play into that energy efficiency. So the HVAC system costs at 39-year, uh, lighting, uh, building envelope, electrical, things like that have to be reduced by the full amount of the deduction. So doing the studies together, if it makes sense for the client, is a, could be a huge benefit where you get both of them. And then we also provide... Um, Not only the studies, but we also provide help with the paperwork that you have to file with your returns. So um, and in the studies, when we provide the actual depreciation for both the 179D and the cost segregation, that's all considered. We do the basis reduction for you. So when you see your depreciation schedule, that's all taken care of. Um, It's just kind of a seamless process that has worked really well. All right. I think uh, we're at a place to go in for final comments here. So, um, Andre, you're up. Any final words of wisdom? 
Uh, yeah, I, I believe it was an anonymous Supreme Court justice that said there's nothing patriotic about overpaying your fair share of taxes. OK, so if you are a commercial building owner um, or a designer of commercial buildings, these programs were literally authored and designed for you by Congress. Uh, so please, please make sure that you're taking advantage of it while we would love to help you out. Um, if there's any questions that you have, definitely feel free to reach out uh, to any of our tax professionals. Well said, well said. <laughs> all right, uh, Glenn. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, we're all cus customer and client focused at our firm. And, you know, Andre and I really enjoy this part of, of the of the work of dealing with clients, helping clients from small clients where it really hits their pocketbook up to, you know, large corporate clients. We enjoy this part. So um, I really encourage anybody that's hearing this and wants to get any more information, don't hesitate to, to reach out to us because this is the fun part of our job, right? The studies, uh, we have people that help us with those, but really helping our clients on the front end and then delivering uh, uh, solid studies that show um, tax savings on the back end is just, it's, it's what we're here for. So we have a great team that's ready to help. And Sarah. Uh, I'm just reminded that in this um, post-inflationary period we've had and high interest rate period, costs for new build and building owners um, have been seriously increased. And here's an opportunity to help blunt that and get some cash back to help to pay for um, these expenditures and these carry costs. And uh, I wouldn't pass it up. And for myself, um, I will sit here and say um, there are a lot of, I would call, uh, uh, less expensive providers of call segregation studies in the markets uh, in our country. Um, however, if anybody's listening to this, I, I, um, is not picking up on the complexities that are here then um, we have not done a good enough job probably <laughs> in our explanations. There is a lot of subtleties. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of complexities, which leads to opportunities to get bigger deductions with the people who know how to do it and also to prepare the, um, the proper forms and filings with the IRS to get it through the system uh, without flags. And, you know, and our teams have been doing, you know, we do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these projects, you know, every year. So uh, again, encourage people buying a new building, building a new building, or even in cases where you're a partnership and you're buying and selling parts of your partnership interests, these are all opportunities to get our teams to take a look at the opportunities for call seg and section 179D. And um, by the way, and I don't think we, we quite said this, you know, our firm looks at it at no cost. So we will do the scope uh, at no expense to you other than the, your opportunity calls to you know, get in the information for us. All right. All right. So that's a wrap on today's discussion about the opportunities to accelerate tax deductions for energy, uh, particularly for energy efficient commercial buildings. Uh, thank you for listening in. A quick disclaimer that we are not providing tax advice on this podcast. Please consult with your tax advisor, hopefully at Cherry Beckert, with your specific tax issues or to discuss information from today's podcast. Check out the firm's website at cbh.com for the latest guidance and materials on this and other tax and business topics. This concludes today's podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, our listeners, for spending your time with us. We truly appreciate it. Let's call it a day and go forth in peace. <laughs>